recently, more or less on an impulse, I took a visit to a railway that I've never been on before. The Epping Onger Railway. This is a heritage railway out in Essex. But what's unusual about this one is that it used to be part of a tube line. Until 1994, this was the Central Line's most extreme outpost. The Epping Onger Railway does not, as yet, reach all the way to Epping Tube Station. However, they do lay on a classic bus service to get you from Epping or Shenfield to North Weald, which is their headquarters. So, you get both the Heritage Railway and the Heritage Rail Replacement Bus Service. I was actually pretty impressed by this service. They had plenty of vehicles on the go, and when the bus to Epping was too crowded, they laid on a second one. My train was hauled by L150, a Great Western Railway 4575 tank engine. Despite its rather fetching livery, it never worked for London Transport. Its current colour scheme was applied in 2013 to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the London Underground. Our train ran from North Weald to Ongar and back, and this journey gives me time to go into the history of the Epping Ongar line. The line was built by the Great Eastern Railway. In the 19th century, Epping Forest was a popular destination for day-trippers. The settlements around here were rural villages, which railway companies saw as being exactly the sort of place where commuters might enjoy living. In 1856, the Eastern Counties Railway reached Loughton from Fenchurch Street, and there were various schemes to extend further. In the end, it was the Great Eastern Railway, which had taken over the Eastern Counties Railway in 1862, who got their way with a line to Onga. That opened on the 24th of April, 1865. As well as Epping and Ongar, this stretch of line included two other stations, North Weald, which served a small village, and Blake Hall, which didn't serve much at all. In truth, this line was never particularly busy. In some ways, it was the Great Eastern Railway's own fault. They charged high fares for the line, encouraging first-class travel, which meant that it was a less attractive area for your average Joe to settle, so there wasn't the kind of large-scale housing development typical of other places served by the Great Eastern Railway's London suburban trains. Typical passenger trains consisted of two coaches, which were never full. There was, however, plenty of milk traffic from local dairy farms. During the First World War, an airfield was built at North Weald, which did bring some traffic, and this was expanded during the Second World War. There were ideas to try to increase passenger numbers by extending the line. One proposal would have seen a rail connection to Shenfield, and another would have built a line to Bury St Edmunds. But no one really wanted to take the plunge and risk an even longer railway that no one used. Meanwhile, places like Loughton, Leytonstone and Stratford grew substantially during the 20th century. By this time, the line was owned by the London and North Eastern Railway, who were an organisation with a lot of track, but not a lot of money. London's suburban routes were a problem for them, because they had enormous numbers of passengers, too many for the existing trains and facilities. But the LNER couldn't afford to upgrade. In 1935, the New Works programme was published, which announced that the Underground would be taking a number of those suburban lines over. The Underground could provide faster, more frequent electric trains that would run all the way into London. The line from Stratford to Ongar would be connected to the Central Line, which, all in all, sounded like a good solution. Except for the Epping Ongar route. Once you got past Epping, passenger numbers dropped off dramatically and the Underground's plans were about to suffer a couple of blows. The Second World War was the first. The money that had been available for big works programmes before the war had to go on rebuilding. And the second blow was the Green Belt. This was a post-war scheme to designate a ring of countryside around London as protected from development, a response to the outward sprawl of the suburbs. A number of plans to extend the underground involved places that were now part of the Green Belt, the assumption before the war being that those places would be developed. Extensions to Bushy Heath and Denham were dropped. The Epping Onger section was also in this belt. So the question arose, with so few passengers and little prospect of suburban growth, was it even worth adding it to the underground? In 1949, electrification got as far as Epping, but the line to Ongar remained very much a country branch line, worked by ancient Great Eastern Railway locomotives hauling wooden-bodied carriages along a single-track line. These trains were hired from British Railways, although operated by London Underground. London Transport spent years debating what to do with this line. In the end, they went with electrification, but the bare minimum. 
In November 1957, the first electric trains reached Onga. There would be no doubling of track, and the section would usually be operated as a separate shuttle for mapping. Trains were restricted to four coaches in length, partly due to low passenger numbers, partly due to short platforms at North Weald, but mostly because of the power supply. Normally the underground maintains the level of voltage across its network with substations. They decided to operate the entire Epping Onga section from the Epping substation, resulting in a serious voltage drop by the time the trains got to Onga. In fact, staff at stations along the lines always said that they could tell when a train was coming because the station lights would dim. When two trains were using the line, it was reported that both would stop when they passed each other at North Weald. Passengers found the service inconvenient and uncomfortable. What was more, the fares were high. As the service was outside of London, it didn't receive subsidies from the Greater London Council. Local authorities didn't see it as their problem, so paid as little towards it as they could. In 1966, the station's goods yards closed, reducing traffic still further. At Blake Hall, passenger numbers were down to 260 a week. Off-peak trains might be carrying as few as 10 passengers. In 1970, London Transport tried to close the entire section, but they were prevented by the fact that there was insufficient alternative transport. There was a bus route, number 339, but it was slow compared to the tube. Nevertheless, cuts were made. The passing loop was lifted at North Weald, meaning that only a single train could run on the section, which reduced train frequency to one every 40 minutes. Blake Hall was closed in 1981, by which time it was reportedly seeing an average of eight passengers a day. By the 90s, the line was losing approximately seven pounds per passenger. Many commuters simply preferred to drive, it was just more convenient. It was rumoured that the line was only kept open to enable government officials to reach the nuclear bunker at Kelverdon Hatch, although I should emphasise that this is an urban legend. In 1994, the axe finally fell. Major maintenance was badly needed, and I'm sure you can imagine how keen London Transport were to carry that out. Spoiler, not very. And on the 30th of September, the last train ran, blowing its whistle in the early hours of the morning. And so, tube trains would run no further than Epping. But as was once said of the Linton and Barnstaple Railway, Railway, perchance it was not dead, but merely sleeping. One idea suggested before the line was closed was to go for a light rail system similar to the one in Newcastle. In 1998, the line was bought up by a company called Pilot Developments with the idea of running an independent rail service. This came to nothing. But fortunately, an organisation called the Epping Onga Railway Volunteer Society came to the rescue, with a plan to turn the line into a heritage railway. On the 10th of October 2004, 10 years and 10 days after closure, the Epping Onga Railway ran their first trains over the disused line. In 2007, the line was sold again and the strategic decision was made to close down and upgrade the railway. In 2012, it reopened. I was quite impressed on my visit. The facilities are good, the staff were friendly and helpful, and the bus service means that it's easy to get to. I'd also like to give a shout out to the viewers of this channel who said hello, really made my day. Thank you, chaps. Anyway, as I said, the line does not yet go all the way to Epping, only reaching from Onga to Epping Forest, but the long-term plan is to reinstate the original line as much as possible. There are still ghosts of the Epping Onga service here and there. There are a few tube maps where the section has been plated over, for example. And this sign at Oakwood warns that you can't get a train to Blake Hall on Sunday, which is still technically true. But the most unusual echo is the fact that even now, nearly 30 years after the service ended, London Underground still uses Onga as the zero point when measuring distances on the network. Well, I hope you enjoyed this underpowered tale from the tube. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like as ever to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the substation to my voltage drop. Thanks also to the chaps at Epping Signal Cabin for filling me in on some of the historical details. And I will see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.